Crush your enemies. They drew first blood, not me. See them driven before you? Oh, my user. And they hear the lamentation of the women. But I pity the fool. Glitter in the dark near the ten hours of gate. Phone home. They're here. I'm a real light sleeper, child. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Cannery Row, released February 12, 1982. It was written by David S. Ward, based on the novel by John Steinbeck, with uncredited work from William Graham, directed by Ward, and released by MGM United Artists. Will Graham? Will Graham. <laughs> the profiler for the FBI? Right, yeah. From uh, CSI, the original, right? <laughs> well, William Peterson did play Will Graham in Manhunter. Yeah. In the early 1900s, a waterfront street in Monterey, California, became home to several sardine canning factories, earning it the nickname Cannery Row. These canning businesses became substantial profit centers during World Wars I and II, but the consequent overfishing in the area wiped out the local sardine population, and the canneries were forced to shut down one at a time with the last of them closing its doors for good in the early 70s. Nowadays, Cannery Row is likely as famous for its canning history as it is for the part it plays in novelist John Steinbeck's celebrated work of the same name. Steinbeck's book was published in 1945 and told the story of the titular California town during the Great Depression and of its eccentric residents, in particular a young marine biologist named Doc Eddie Daniels. Nine years later, in 54, Steinbeck wrote a sequel novel, Sweet Thursday, about a group of the town's derelicts pooling together to help their friend Doc find love. The first attempted film adaptation of this story came before the second book was even published. Producer Bernie Byrons purchased the film rights from Steinbeck himself for $25,000, but a series of unexpected delays soured Steinbeck on the project, and he successfully sued Byrons to get the rights back. After Sweet Thursday's publication, Broadway producers Cy Fewer and Ernie Martin were the first to suggest combining the novels into a single musical adaptation and successfully attached the celebrated musical writing team of Rodgers and Hammerstein to write the songs for their show, now retitled Pipe Dream. Fewer and Martin insisted on casting Henry Fonda as Doc, but Hammerstein was steadfastly against it as Fonda had recently married his daughter. <laughs> Unf unfortunately, Pipe Dream landed in the middle of a rare losing streak for the duo. I've never heard of it, so it right, yeah. must have been. <laughs> it's definitely a lesser work of theirs, or it's remembered as a lesser work. It premiered on Broadway in November of 55 and existed in a constant state of revision until it was finally shuttered seven months later. Unlike most of their collaborations, Pipe Dream was never considered for a direct film adaptation, though the musical supposedly came close to resurrection as a vehicle for Jim Henson's Muppets. Oh, really? Unfortunately, those talks went nowhere. Oh, interesting. I just want to do everything with the Muppets. Right? <laughs> I feel like people are talking to them like, the only way you're allowed to remake my movie is if you do it with Muppets. You yeah. Know? <laughs> and which person stays a human? <laughs> I can't wait for the Oppenheimer Muppets movie. Yeah. yeah. Muppenheimer. <laughs> the next adaptation took shape in the late 70s when MGM producer Michael Phillips pitched a non-musical adaptation of the same combined novels, this time simply called Cannery Row, the title of the first book. <laughs> Sorry. This... It's just funny to think of it as it's like I'm gonna pitch a an adaptation, a non musical. It's like you could just say an adaptation. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. But the the mo the more famous adaptation right. was the musical at the time. It reminds me though. Do you remember the last time we discussed the non musical version of a play? There was a show where some students were mm. gonna be performing the non musical version of a famous musical. Was it Les Misérables? It was a non musical version of Greece. Greece. Uh, okay. Fame. <laughs> the students from Fame did a non-musical yeah. version. <laughs> Student bodies. What is all this? It's from the junior class play. They're doing a non-musical version of Greece. Couldn't get the rights to the music. Oh, okay. The Sting scribe David S. Ward was brought on, but because Rodgers and Hammerstein owned all the stage rights and screen rights to the second novel, they had to be bought back from them for $50,000 before the project could move forward with Columbia set to distribute. Upon seeing the first draft of the script, Columbia dropped the project from their slate and their financing focus shifted to Universal for several rewrites, with producers angling on attaching Ward's Sting collaborator Paul Newman as Doc. Unfortunately for Ward, Newman passed on the role, 
But much later, he played another Doc character for his final feature film in Pixar's Cars. I really would have liked Paul Newman in this role. I think it would have been great, yeah. I I think Nick Nolte does great. I mean, he does great. I'm just saying that if somebody were to do it better than it was done, probably Paul Newman. Next, the part of Doc was passed to Jack Nicholson, who also passed, at which point Universal officially backed out and it bounced on down the totem pole until Nick Nolte expressed an interest in the lead and MGM agreed to a budget of $8 million. For the female lead, Ward had hoped to cast the little-known Dutch actress Monique Vandeven, who we saw last as a cast member from Undercover Girl, the fictional TV series from the B-plot of 1980s Stunt Rock. <laughs> That's literally the only thing we've seen her in so wow. far. Wow. That's a deep cut. MGM head David Begelman was obviously looking for a bigger return on his $8 million investment and insisted on name actresses. Jessica Lange was on his short list, and he also pitched Bo Derek, Liza Minnelli, and Olivia Newton-John, none of whom met with Ward's approval. Though I bet Minnelli would have been great, actually, in this story. Yeah. Then, Begelman worked outside the character's age range with offers to Julie Christie and eventually Raquel Welch, who accepted the role. Oh, really? The part of the story's narrator was offered first to Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath star Henry Fonda after Hammerstein's veto kept him out of the Pipe Dream Broadway run. When he turned the part down, it went to John Huston. The original intent was to shoot in Cannery Row as itself, but redressing the town's modernizations would be costly, and the decision was made to move the bulk of the film to an MGM soundstage, not unlike what we saw recently in Coppola's One from the Heart. Though in that case, Zoetrope somehow spent way more shooting on a soundstage than they would have on location. After five days of shooting, an effort was made by the filmmakers to fire Raquel Welch from the film and void her pay-or-play contract by claiming she was let go for cause and replacing her with Deborah Winger, 15 years her junior. Welch was accused of taking exorbitantly long on hair and makeup before each scene to the point that it was causing scheduling delays. But four years later, Welch argued in court that she had been made a scapegoat by first-time director Ward looking to blame his own scheduling mistakes on an actress he hadn't wanted to cast in the first place. But she, she was successful in that argument? Ultimately, Welch won her suit and was granted a whopping $2 million oh in God. damages. But beyond that, for the damage to her professional reputation, she was awarded an additional $8 million in punitive what? damages. Meaning the decisions together amounted to more than MGM's entire investment in the film. Oh my God. An effort was made in the 90s to appeal this decision, but it was upheld and Welch was never cast in another lead role. It basically ruined her career. Wow. She wasn't really making $10 million on features anyways. No, but she could still have been the lead in in films after that, and it just never happened again. Yeah. The film hit another legal snag when second AC Peter Santoro was arrested on the set when it was discovered he'd stolen nearly $1.4 million worth of camera equipment from Universal Studios in the last five years. (laughs) (laughs) When Cannery Row eventually reached theaters, it recouped less than half of its reported $11.5 million budget not including $10 million that were awarded to Raquel Welch right, later. Right, right. Wow. MGM head Begelman later admitted he should never have greenlit the film in the first place, but if you'll recall from our review of Ragtime, he only wound up at MGM after he was caught embezzling money by issuing fraudulent paychecks to himself and reporting the income to the IRS as payments to Columbia's contract players. I think the first hint was Cliff Robertson got a letter from the IRS about some payment that he never received, and he was like, hey, what is this? <laughs> and they were like, Oh, yeah, uh, we don't know what that is. And then they traced it all the way back to Begelman paying himself under the names of all these other actors. That's crazy. Begelman's time at MGM ended with similar accusations of fraud when he reportedly misrepresented the budgets of their films and pocketed the difference. After MGM, Begelman founded his own Gladden Entertainment, producing smaller projects for distribution by the Canon Group. And you'll never believe this, Begelman failed at that, too. And depressed over the inevitable bankruptcy of his own Gladden Entertainment, he shot himself in a hotel room in August of 1995. Jeez. The same month, a theatrical stage play adaptation of Steinbeck's Cannery Row premiered two decent reviews. The story begins with a shot of the sea just before dawn. We see the silhouette of a man we'll come to know as the seer climbing a ladder to a concrete platform over the water. We hear a magical twinkling sound in the audio. I think we hear something similar when the ghost cowboy shows up in Scream in 1981. (laughs) The voice of John Huston pipes up to set the scene. Cannery Row has never been like anywhere else. For one thing, its people are different. When the town died off, most of them failed to notice. Some say nobody would live here if they didn't have to. But there are some, like the seer, 
who wouldn't live anywhere else, even if they could. The seer withdraws a trumpet from his bag and plays a solo toward town with his back to the water. We cut into the kitchen of Doc, played by Nick Nolte as he prepares breakfast. We're told that he collects marine life for research purposes and sells them to local colleges and museums. He's made a very wet sandwich. Right, yeah. Like, it's just, it's two pieces of, like, white bread, but as he's biting into it, it's just, like, dripping everywhere. Yeah. Delicious. Soup sandwich. Outside Doc's window, we see Mac and the boys, a crew of residentially challenged layabouts. Mac is being played by M. Emmett Walsh, and he leads this merry band of misfits. The boys wait for Mac to wake up, and eventually Hazel, as played by Frank McRae, is elected to wake their leader. They remind Mac that he promised to lead them in a morning exercise. I said that? Yeah, that's right. That's right, yeah, Mac. Yeah. Jesus, I must have been drunk as hell. Mac climbs out of a big metal pipe he was sleeping in and delivers on his promise for maybe eight seconds before he's already winded. On his way out the door, Doc calls to the boys and asks Mac to feed his mice while he's on an overnight trip to La Jolla and offers the contents of his fridge as payment. I don't think you get to judge Mac here. <laughs> what? I can go at least 12 seconds of jumping jacks before I'm done for the week. And Mac was covered in keys. So yeah, he's like, got a necklace just covered. He's like, like Jacob Marley. <laughs> right, yeah. More of gravy than of grave. Mac and the boys agree that Doc is a generous and wonderful guy, even suggesting they should find some way to repay his eternal kindness. Doc carries a lot of equipment to his car and leaves to collect marine life from the tides of La Jolla, and on day three, he locates a small family of octopi. Back at home, he builds a tank for the creatures, and Mac stops by for a visit. He tries to launch into a whole story, but Doc cuts him off. How much do you need, Mac? Two bucks. Here. Take that one out. Just like that? Well, what about my story? What story? Well, I had this story about why I needed two bucks, but you didn't give me a chance to do it. You don't need this story, Mac. Well, the hell I don't. I mean, you know, I worked all night on the damn thing. You know, Hazel cried when I tried it on him. He launches into the story anyway, and right away Doc's poking holes in it, but Mac reminds him, it's just a story. This is just the story for the money. Doc seems distracted and admits he's preoccupied with how to light this octopus tank, since these creatures seem to hide from all light sources. Mac is quick to suggest giving up, which is probably why he's here borrowing $2 now. Mm -hmm. He doesn't see the importance of Doc's study, but Doc wants to make a name for himself on the local science scene by writing a paper about the octopi and the way they express emotion. I think I'll call my paper Symptoms in some cephalopoda approximating we see a woman we'll come to know as Susie carrying a suitcase through the archways of an abandoned cannery toward the Golden Poppy Cafe. She asks the woman behind the counter if any of the canneries are hiring, but the woman explains the town dried up with the sardine population. Susie plans to keep looking around here and asks to leave her suitcase behind the counter. You're not going to apply here, though? <laughs> She's going <laughs> to... you got to check everywhere else first. Well, I feel like this woman is obviously... Because she, she asks, like, uh, you know... Can you leave it for the night shift? It's like, there is no, I am yeah. the night shift. Oh, what if you're off shift by the time I get back? Honey, I ain't never off shift. Out at the water's edge, Susie finds an unattended paper bag and within it, some fresh bread to eat. The bearded seer of the beach notices her. Would you like some salami with that? I'm sorry. I, I didn't know this was your bag. Oh, it's all right. You're welcome to anything in it. He senses she's had a hard day and asks how he can help, explaining that all his needs are met by his friends above. He suggests a relaxing swim, and they confess to each other that neither knows how. The seer just walks in up to his chest, he says. Back at home, Doc is peeking out the window and sees Susie walk by. Soon after, Mac and the boys notice her too. She pops into an establishment called the Bear Flag Restaurant. In the second book, Sweet Thursday, we learn that the owner-operator of this establishment wanted to call it the Lone Star Restaurant, but her sister informed her that's a Texas reference and California has a different flag, so it became the Bear Flag Restaurant. <laughs> I read both books yesterday. They're good. Did, did you really? Yeah. A doorman, played by Art LaFleur, lets her into the building. Moving through the lobby, a lot of women in silken gowns watch her pass by. It seems clear already this is a brothel masquerading as a restaurant. The doorman introduces Susie to the madam, Fauna, played by Audra Lindley. The books explain that her birth name was Flora, until someone joked that she seemed more like a Fauna, so she changed it. <laughs> Susie asks Fauna for a job as a waitress. A waitress? This is the Bear Flag restaurant, isn't it? 
Yeah, but we don't serve too many sandwiches in here. When reality sets in, Susie isn't totally frightened off applying here. She admits she has no experience in the oldest profession, but wonders how hard it could be. What do you gotta do besides lie down? You gotta pretend that you like it. Fauna invites Susie to persuade her with a sob story, but Susie won't share one. Outside the office, an argument between the girls gets louder and suddenly things are breaking, so Fauna closes the door to mute it. Susie finally gives up some personal info. She started in Indiana but ran away at 10. From here, Susie is uncomfortable sharing the truth and so provides an outlandish one in its place, and Fauna gets her point. After being a runner-up in the Miss America pageant, I went directly into professional ice skating. You don't say. That's correct. Fauna can tell from Susie's hands that she's worked hard labor, and Susie admits she just wants a job that will show her a little respect, which begs the question, why are you applying at a brothel? <laughs> <laughs> Fauna offers her a temporary spot filling in for a girl on leave and tells her to buy a dress. Fancy, but cheap. We watch Doc studying the octopi and intentionally trying to piss them off, but he suffers from writer's block and needs a change of pace. But he's like making faces at it through the tank. Right. And one time it actually like freaks out when he jumps at it. We cut to Doc at a concert hall enjoying a live musical performance. He spots a fancily dressed woman in his row we'll come to know as Ellen. I think she gets a full name Ellen Sedgwick later. Yes. It's like that seemed unnecessary to fully name this character. That we'll never see again. Yeah. But we cut right to them in bed together post coitus and then this is the last shot she's in. Even sex doesn't inspire him to write though. We cut to the next morning at the local general store run by a Mexican man named Joseph and Mary. The book explains that Joseph and Mary is a veteran of the Zoot Suit Riots and once operated a store selling switchblades to Pachucos before he moved north. Fauna is here with Susie buying pencils and paper to fulfill her growing orders for horoscope readings. So she does horror readings and horoscope <laughs> nah. readings. Susie notices Doc walking by outside with a paper bag full of bread and other snacks. He fails miserably to hide the bag in his arms on his way to the beach where he anonymously leaves it for the seer each day. Fauna confirms that Doc has maintained this daily tradition for over a decade now. Him and the boys even build him a little house out there on the dunes. And the guy still thinks it all comes from heaven. Man, he ain't all with it up here, you know what I mean? Doc pops into the store to buy a couple beers, and Fauna introduces him to Susie. He seems disappointed to learn she'll be joining the staff of the Bear Flag restaurant. He says he's just here for a beer, and it reminds Susie of a guy she knew who was always threatening to order a beer milkshake but never followed through. They sit in an awkward silence until Joseph and Mary returns with the Doc's beer, at which point he pays and leaves. Sometime later, Doc is working in his laboratory when Susie arrives with cookies and beer, a gift from Fauna. I wonder what she wants. Nothing. I think she was doing it. Susie accidentally sets the dish down on a snake tank and it hisses at her. Doc explains that he sells the snake's venom, but she thinks snakes are gross and eventually admits she's only offended on Fauna's behalf because Doc assumed this gift came with strings attached. Doc apologizes for his assumption and offers to split the beer with Susie. He tells her that he has petri dishes full of sea urchin embryos. He kills them in small batches every half hour during the development process so that he can observe their changes under a microscope over time. He says they can learn more about humans this way, which doesn't seem true. <laughs> It's like, well, we didn't know in the 1930s whether or not humans had evolved from sea urchins yet. Susie asks why he's using urchins instead of humans. Why don't they just study people? <laughs> It'd be a little difficult to kill unborn babies every half hour, wouldn't it? She seems embarrassed by her own question and defensively refers to his profession as a funny one. There are funnier businesses. Well, I guess you'd be talking about my business now. He accuses prostitution of being a sad substitute for love, and she suggests that this laboratory serves the same purpose. You sit here reading starfish for Christ's sake! Sea urchins! What the hell do you think that's a substitute for, huh? Susie seems to take it a step too far when she calls Doc out for his writer's block. She claims the whole town's laughing at him behind his back because they know he'll never finish his scientific paper. We haven't really seen any evidence of this, though, right? Of what? Like, the town... Like the town of the town laughing at him? No. Yeah, yeah, no. Like, I think they all respect what he does and think he's smart. I think Fauna might have said something offhand, but she didn't mean it in any cruel way, but now he thinks literally everybody's making fun of him about it. When Doc asks who's laughing at him, she tries to take the comment back and leaves abruptly. That night, the Bear Flag restaurant is hopping, and men from town are flooding in. Susie enters a room with a customer and aggressively refuses to undress before he compliments the outfit she bought today. The man sheepishly admits she looks nice before they get to business. This is like the kindest portrayal of prostitution I've ever seen in a film. Yeah. It's like she just went on a date with a guy for a little bit of money. 
Susie looks out the window of her room and spots Doc sitting on his porch. She undresses while staring down at him, but just as she turns away, he notices her. He watches her continue stripping, facing her John, and then she leaves the window frame. Doc is clearly taken by her form and decides to leave town to get her out of his head. Later that night, Fauna finds Susie laying on a couch in the Bear Flag lobby. She asks a series of questions about Doc and why a man of science would sequester himself in this rundown community, and Fauna lets it slip that he used to be a pitcher in Major League Baseball. Upon learning this, Susie is retroactively starstruck. The Blur? Eddie the Blur Daniels? The what? He used to pitch for the Philadelphia Athletics. Geez, I remember him. They called him the Blur because his... His pitches were so fast that no one could see him. Susie wonders aloud why Doc gave up playing ball, but Fauna says he doesn't like to talk about it. When we learn the reason, though, you'd think Susie would have heard the story if she's such a big baseball fan. Yeah. Like, just given only his name, she knows exactly how many games he's won as a pitcher. So she she has his stats memorized, but she didn't hear the story of why he quit. I also think it's funny that uh, she says, like, baseball, you mean Major League? I was yeah. Like, major League? <laughs> Which is another David S. Ward product. <laughs> yeah. David, David has words is on the set, like with a tape recorder. Note to self. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way it sounds when people say those words. Connor says nobody here has a nice story, so they don't bother each other to hear them. An hour outside of town, Doc parks beside a diner and orders a beer milkshake. A beer milkshake? That's right. Use vanilla ice cream and a half a bottle of beer. The waitress mixes one up, and Doc takes a single sip before deciding he's done with it. Now we're going to take a little pause. I'm going to go make a beer that milkshake. awful. Are you really going to do it? Yeah, we have like, the ingredients. Well, like me and my egg creams? Yep, <laughs> but we're going to do it here live on the show. Gross. Do you even know how to make a milkshake? Put a little boogie in it? Or is that a different joke? <laughs> how do you make a milkshake? <laughs> oh, my God. When I make a milkshake, uh, I just use ice cream and milk until you get the consistency that you want. When you make a milkshake... On average, how many boys does it bring to the yard? <laughs> One minimum. <laughs> Do you say milk? No, you don't add milk to it because that's not the recipe it gives her. The whole reason I wanted to do this is because it actually looked appetizing to me in the movie. Mm. I was like, I wonder if that's as bad as he's pretending it is. Should I be out there? Or you gonna... No, I'm going to bring it in here. Okay. All right, so we got it started here. I'm just going to top it off a little bit, maybe in front of the mic, so we can hear that beer mixing into the ice cream. Ooh, that still looks oh. pretty good to me. Ew. You don't think that looks good? <laughs> no, I don't. All right, let's see what this monstrosity tastes like. I mean, it looks disgusting, but I'm still going to try it. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. <laughs> it's not got, that bad. It's got to be bad, though. You like everything. It's not that bad. You want a sip? I'm going to try it. I have to pretend it's good until Jesse at least takes a sip. Uh, yeah. Come over here. It's, like, mm, it's real good. Oh, it goes down oh, smooth. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually not terrible. Yeah, it's not terrible. <laughs> I think a lot of it would have to do with the beer you use. Well, this is Budweiser. I, I specifically got the king Budweiser of beers because <laughs> this is what she uses in the movie. Though she's pouring a, a half oh, a right. bottle of I Budweiser mean, in. It the... tastes like you know one of those. I mean, I don't want to say it tastes like a craft ale, but it tastes like one of those ales where they're like, "Ooh, this one will have a vanilla buttery taste to it." It honestly doesn't taste far off from like a root beer float or any other like. I mean, half of the ingredient here is the ice cream, and mm. that's the overpowering flavor of it. There, yeah. It's just a little bit fizzy from the beer, and there's like a faint taste of hops to it. Yeah, but. I mean, it's got that little bit of bitterness that beer has, but it's it's okay. It's not... It's not I a, would order this again. It's not a drink I would order. <laughs> no? No. It only makes me feel slightly sick. Oh, I, I wonder if they offer them at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh. At the aquarium? Well, because uh, cause Doc's lab is right next door. Right, yeah. Well, the aquarium wasn't there, obviously, at the time. But... Right, right, right. You don't have to finish it. I don't. <laughs> no. With the podcast <laughs> or this drink? <laughs> God, we can be done. We're all good. We can be done with this whole thing, man. And that's a wrap on the podcast. <laughs> oh, thanks. One this beer milkshake was all it took. <sighs> should have done this sooner. Maybe we should have actually made egg creams on the show. I could have been done years ago. Because <laughs> we would have quit back then. <laughs> anyway. It's not as bad as, as Doc pretends. It's actually pretty delicious. Maybe the ice cream makes a difference. This is good ice cream. Even though it's probably just like store brand vanilla. No, it was store brand. It wasn't yeah. even real vanilla ice cream. It was like artificial vanilla. Well, it's good. 
I didn't splurge on this experiment. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I had to go to three places to find somewhere that sold Budweiser by, by the, the can. can. <laughs> because first I went to our, our regular, the gas station I always go to for soda. They don't even have alcoholic beverages in there. Oh, None. really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Oh, that's funny. And then I went to Vaughn's and they didn't have anything that was individual. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had every other brand individual, but no Budweiser. Oh, okay. So then I had to stop at the, the liquor store in the Wells Fargo parking lot. Oh, there. okay. I've never been in there. What do they have? The kids are like, why is dad stopping at three places on the way home from school <laughs> to buy beer? Do you ever go to that place? Because I always think Which place? they might have like closer food when we're like, oh my God, I'm out of milk. Oh, I didn't really check for other grocery stuff. But the the um, the um Circle K right up the street has milk and stuff like that in an emergency. I don't think they're open super late, though. Neither of those places. I think they both close by like 10. And strange things happen there. Yeah. Strange things are afoot there. Oh, at the Circle K? I yeah. get it. I get it. Oh, I had to spell it out. <laughs> I don't know. I just work here. <laughs> we cut back to Cannery Row. Where? Hold on. I have to throw up. <laughs> just kidding. <clears throat> We cut back to Cannery Row, where we learn that the film's score is being provided by M. Emmett Walsh S. Mack sitting down at a piano. Behind him, we see the seer playing the trumpet atop a boiler above a building. Susie walks by Doc's lab again, but doesn't see him inside. The next day, we see Fauna and Doc having lunch together, and we learn the purpose of Fauna's gift earlier. She wants Doc to ask Susie out the way he does any other woman he falls for around here. She thinks it'll improve Susie's confidence. She extrapolates that if Susie knew her worth, she wouldn't be at the Bear Flag in the first place, which is a shitty thing for the Madam of the Bear Flag restaurant to say about herself and all the other women working there. It's like, if we could just teach her some self-respect, she would never work with me and all of my coworkers. Yeah, why, what's it saying about the rest of the women that work there, that, that she doesn't put this effort into trying to get them out of there? When Doc seems reluctant, Fauna amends her request. I don't know, Fauna. It seems a little far-fetched. You don't have to make no pass. Just be nice to her. I'll have to think about it. It's like, you could be nice to a person. Just be <laughs> nice. He goes to speak with the seer on the beach. They chat about the octopi on their way to addressing Doc's bigger problems. I do like, though, that the seer, like, has some sort of fabled ability to speak with animals. And he's like, I wish you could just ask the octopus why they get so angry. And he's like, I did. They wouldn't tell me. Very tight-lipped to the octopi. <laughs> with regard to Doc's bigger problems, the seer thinks that a man can't do everything alone. But he locks up when Doc asks for more specific advice, and then Doc apologizes for asking so many questions. The seer leaves to watch the sunset, otherwise it might not. It's time I go watch the sunset now. I wouldn't be much of a seer if I didn't do that. I've even come to think that it wouldn't go down without me. Doc plays a game of darts at home and suddenly notices he can see straight through into the brothel next door. Susie stands idly twirling in the lobby, so Doc wanders over to the building. For the last 20 yards, he tries to be sneaky because he doesn't want to be confused for a customer of this establishment. He knocks on a window to get Susie's attention and then climbs inside. She tries to apologize about what was said in their last conversation, and he tells her there's nothing to apologize for, and it's important that they're honest with each other. Meaning what? That I am a floozy? No, I didn't mean that! What then? I didn't mean... Susie throws open her robe to put her hands on her hips in anger, and Doc is distracted by the Little Bo Peep dress underneath. She says it's costume night, and some of her customers are into it. They don't do costume nights at the brothel I go to. That sounds fun. <laughs> I think you could just request those kinds yeah? of things. <laughs> just call ahead, I guess. Do you have a bee costume? <laughs> Sexy bee. <laughs> That's a little redundant. <laughs> Doc hands her her shepherd's crook, and they launch right back into their fight from a few days ago. It seems like Fauna's request is going unfulfilled. He refuses to be nice. She points out he doesn't have a wife or girlfriend, so he can't criticize her relationships with men, and he says he has no trouble in that department. She admits here that she watched him the other night and saw the girl he brought home leave just before midnight. Susie suspects she was scared away by his bug collection. Then she confronts Doc with his secret baseball past and mentions a game she heard once. Who told you that? I heard you pitch once. You heard me? On the radio at this diner I used to work at. I remember it because one of my favorites, Louis Delano, got a triple off of you. That's because Behringer, my right fielder, was drunk and fell down. It should have been a routine oh, out. the crack of that bat was so loud. I know a solid hit when I hear one. And if that woman loved your bug so much, how come she left early? Because she had an appointment. At 11 o'clock at night, Doc? She's got a busy schedule. Hell, I'd have been embarrassed to run out of hit like that. Oh, he did bounce off the wall, Doc! Yeah, after Behringer got up and kicked it, Delano couldn't hit the wall for playing in here! 
<laughs> I just like the way he says that line. This is probably my favorite back and forth in the film. Well, because they're combining two different stories. Yeah. Like they're jumping back and forth mm. between the subjects. But I, I mean, Deborah Winger is great, but I think Nick Nolte is doing such a great job with his delivery of almost every line. You just really feel what he's saying in your heart a lot of the time. And when he gets to that line, when he gets real loud about, he couldn't hit the walls if we were playing in here. Like, I wish more of the film were like this when they're arguing instead of stuff that seems less substantial. Eventually, Doc admits that the girl left to return to her husband, and Susie accuses him of being a homewrecker. I may be a floozy, but I ain't no homewrecker. That's disgusting. Oh, yeah? I'm sure Fauna calls a whole wreckers to make sure that every guy that comes in here is single. In the absence of a suitable retort, Susie falls to the ground and admits she doesn't know why they're fighting. I don't know, Doc. Look, every time I talk to you, I get more confused. I like you just fine when you're not around. The music changes on the jukebox and Susie stands to silence it, but Doc is a fan of the song. In fact, he claims to know the whole band by name, but Susie says that music is for dancing, not memorizing. Doc takes this as a challenge and they launch into a dance-off. What follows is a long montage of two people who don't seem like dancers dancing. Without any warning, Susie attempts to roll backward from a handstand onto Doc's shoulders, but he doesn't see it coming because he's facing the other way. What the hell was that? I call it an over the rainbow. I knew you wouldn't be able to do it. Do you recall the last time we had an over the rainbow? Under the rainbow. We had an under the rainbow. <laughs> over it. the rainbow. Just going back and forth. We see them try the same dumb trick over and over until finally Doc catches her legs and eventually they pull it off and she somersaults forward off his shoulders. The dancing done, he asks her to dinner later this week, and when he tries to leave, he finds the window full of Mac and the boys. When he turns to exit through the curtain to the lobby, he finds Fauna and the girls listening in. Everyone has a vested interest in this relationship already. The next morning, we see Mac and the boys playing miniature golf on a makeshift course at the end of the wharf. Mac announces to the gang that they will repay their friend Doc with a surprise party. Hazel stops by Doc's place to inform him that Mac needs money, and they'd like to work for him if there's anything they can do. He does have an upcoming order for hundreds of frogs, and he offers them a nickel per frog. Mac and the boys steal Joseph and Mary's truck and head out to a local pond at night to do their frog hunting. The boys crowd the pond from one side and set up a wall of flashlights on the opposite side so they can scoop the whole batch together in one solid clump. The method is effective, but disturbing, since many of these live frogs are clearly being smashed by the actors. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it, it, it's not the only scene. I get that they're just frogs, but it's still really disturbing to watch. Because if, if, so, if I were an actor and someone was like, just jump in here into this pond, it's like, all these I'm going to kill frogs if I do that. And they're like, yeah, yeah but we have like... 4,000, so it's fine. Yeah, it's so like, I don't want to do that. That's yeah. that is really disturbing to me. Yeah. Well, and that seems a little weird that we're willing to, like, just smash frogs all over the place here in multiple scenes. Right. But the snakes aren't real in the tanks? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. why are the snakes fake? You well, know, You know how expensive fake frogs are? <laughs> well, but I'm just saying, like... In terms of something that you could easily probably get a hold of, put it in a cage. It's not going to get hurt. It's not going to get yeah, lost. Yeah, they, they never open a rattler killed. aquarium. Yeah. Or terrarium. But, but, like, every time he, like, knocks on the glass or they bump into it, these snakes aren't moving. Right. It's very obvious. The narrator tells us they've collected about a 1,000 frogs for a score of over $50 from Doc, but they don't actually count them. We just... The narrator knows. He's omniscient. Ah. Because he's John Houston or because... <laughs> yes. Yes. We cut to Doc getting dressed up for his date with Susie, and Joseph and Mary is here complimenting his suit. Then we see the girls prepping Susie for the same date. Fauna advises Susie to just be herself. Back at Doc's place, he worries he's overdoing it. Why bother with the suit? Just dress normal. What am I putting myself in this for? I ought to wear what I normally wear. So she thinks I'm underdressed. Who cares what she thinks? Don't get me, Doc. I'm just sitting here. Doc heads over to collect Susie in khaki pants, a brown leather jacket, and a fedora, looking vaguely Indiana Jones. She answers the door in a nice dress with a feather boa and cap. Doc is overcome at the sight of her and leaves suddenly to make a phone call. What is this moment supposed to be? I don't really get He's it. He's going home to change. Oh, okay. He needed an excuse. He's like, I have to go make a phone call so he can change. And, and then when better. we see them on the date, he's dressed nicer. Yeah. We see Doc pull up to the old pilchard inn outside of town. Unaccustomed to eating crab, Susie lags behind Doc to copy his technique. After the meal, during a pause in the conversation, Susie asks again why Doc left baseball. I just figure if we're going to be friends that... I threw a bad pitch. One bad pitch? It hit a guy. Every pitcher hits a guy now and then. It hit him in the head. I 
At first, I thought I'd killed him. He was in a coma for two weeks. He came out of it. But he was never the same after that. She points out it wasn't his fault, but the guilt was enough to force him out of the sport for good. She apologizes for spoiling the night, but he thanks her for coming. She mentions a place with sand dunes that he brought up earlier on this date and asks if she can see it on the way home. You'll ruin your shoes. I know. You should take them off. We cut to a pair of barefoot tracks in the sand leading to Susie and Doc sitting by the water. Do you guys recall the last time we saw a pair of barefoot tracks through sand dunes? Chariots of Fire? No, more recent. Uh, Personal Best? Even more recent. Meaning it would have to be last month because Personal Best was the first of that month. There's sort of a clue in the sentence. A pair of barefoot tracks through sand dunes. Dunes. Did we watch Dune? <laughs> That's it. No. If you walk without rhythm. Uh, it attracts the barefoot tracks? What? Think about the word dunes. Is there a place called dunes that you can think of? Oh, was it one from the heart? It was one from the heart. Remember the title sequence? We saw the little footprints in the miniature sand mm. leading to the, the Dunes Hotel. The Sears trumpet playing leads us out of the scene, and we cut to Doc in the tide pools again, collecting banana slugs and crabs. When Doc gets home from work, he finds his lab all tidied up, the jars and instruments all polished and lined along the table. His desk is sorted, and there's stew simmering on the stovetop. Even his clothes are neatly folded at the foot of his bed. Oh my God. I wanted Mac to be like, see you later, buddy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? At the general store, Mac tells Joseph and Mary about the going price of frogs and asks if he can pay for a dollar's worth of product with 25 frogs. You got a five frog profit there. And nobody loses his shirt. To his own dismay, Joseph and Mary couldn't really find anything wrong with this proposition. Okay. You got a deal. But I don't want no dead frogs. Do you hear that? What follows is a long montage of Mac paying for products with live frogs. And for a moment, we even see one dangling by a leg out of M. Emmett Walsh's mouth. <laughs> I love that he was willing to do this. He's so fun as this character. Yeah. Joseph and Mary starts putting up signs listing the frog prices of his merchandise. And he haggles with a few of Mac's boys over the frog price of different products. One guy tries to buy a pickle with a frog, but Joseph demands two frogs, so the guy takes a big bite out of the pickle and drops it back in the jar with the frog, having purchased half of it fair and square. We cut out to a shipping yard where Mac steps up to bat, swinging and missing twice to a lady pitcher from the Bear Flag restaurant. The seer tries to correct Mac's form, and he's annoyed by the advice. What the hell you know about it? You ever played baseball? Not that I know of. But it seems to me you're going about it all wrong. Something about this answer made me 100% sure this is the guy that Doc yeah. hit with his pitch. Mac invites the seer to bat in his place if he's so sure how to do it. The pitcher doesn't know how to pitch for this stranger, and Fauna tells her to take it easy on him. But he insists that she throw it normal so he can properly demonstrate how to hit. She throws it underhand right over the plate, and he knocks it out of the park. Everyone traces the arc of the ball through the sky with their eyes, and he hands the bat back to Mac, even though the ball is long gone. You know, I think bringing the hands up is the key. We cut to the bear flag where Mac and the boys are getting lessons in etiquette from the girls, who are now all on board for this surprise party idea. They decide on a Snow White theme for the party because Mac and the boys had recently seen and enjoyed the Disney film. Fauna offers to read Hazel's horoscope and seems hesitant to share a bad fortune and so lies that Hazel will someday become the U.S. president, not realizing that this is a worse future than Hazel could possibly have guessed for himself. Uh, uh, I don't want to be no president. You got no choice. The stars have spoke. You just have to go to Washington. But I don't want to. Huh? I don't know nobody there. I'm sorry, Hazel. Ain't there no way I can tell him I won't do it? Nope. A thing like this could, could ruin my whole life. Aww. We see Hazel resting in the roots of a gnarled black cypress tree by the ocean, stressing about his future, but the roto is pretty rough for all these shots of the tree. Yeah. I feel like this isn't even green screen. This looks like something where they just shot at a tree in a field, and then they went and cut out the background. Well, I, I, and I know that there's like a couple of famous like cliffside cypress trees up right, in that yeah. area, and I, I don't know if they, they were trying to imitate. Emulate that, yeah. Yeah. The boys decide to make Snow White-themed costumes for the party. Mm -hmm. 
Mac and the boys couldn't agree on who should be dopey and who should be sneezy. So they all went as trees. <laughs> are there are there a lot of tree characters in that story? There was a lot of, definitely a lot of trees. I guess. But there's also like a woodsman, right? <laughs> That's dangerous. Or is he a huntsman? I guess there's a huntsman, not a woodsman. Never mind. Joseph and Mary arrives in costume as well, but he's never seen Snow White, and so he dressed as Dracula, and we see him conducting a mariachi band. We see crates of frogs piled high behind a banner welcoming Doc home. A kid tells the partiers that someone's coming, so they all hide for the surprise. But standing in the doorway is Hazel, dressed as Abe Lincoln. George Washington. Which dwarf is that? It's George Washington, you idiot! Which is kind of a funny joke, but Lincoln was only shot like 70 years earlier. There's probably people at this party who remember it happening, so I don't think Mac would confuse these two presidents. Maybe he would. But that's like someone seeing a picture of JFK and going, oh, it's Abe Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Nowadays. This actually sounds good. Okay, so I found a bunch of recipes online for beer milkshakes. Apparently yeah. this is a thing. A lot of people are recommending you use a stout. Yes, that's, that's what I've heard people suggest in place yeah. of this. Yeah, and like this recipe, which is labeled cannery row beer milkshake, which doesn't make sense because it's not what they use. She clearly uses vanilla ice cream and a Budweiser, but they use stout and chocolate ice cream. I'm like, that actually kind of sounds good. Well, I mean, there's lots of mixed drinks that have dairy products and Guinness in them, so that makes sense that a stout and an ice cream type flavor would yeah, be good yeah. together. But if it's saying cannery row beer milkshake, like I was saying, I wonder if that is a thing that you can get there. Oh, maybe it's and, like... It, and, and well, that's the, the, the That's why it's in the story in the first place? Is the, the, the Golden Poppy Cafe is actually there. So mm. that's, a, that's a real location. When Doc returns to town, the surprise is successfully pulled off and Mac races to the piano to provide some party music. In the book, Doc catches wind of this party far in advance and spends the entire week shopping and preparing for it since the boys hadn't thought of anything that would be needed for an actual party. So he, like, has to fill his refrigerator with meat and, like, cook it in advance and marinate stuff and, like, get ready for the party that he's not supposed to know is happening so that when they're like, oh, we didn't think to get that, he's like, I already have it, just by coincidence. The banners at this party utilize all the colors of our podcast, though, which is neat. I feel like this is how we would decorate for our own parties. The girls walk down the street toward the party dressed as Snow White and an entourage of princesses. Fauna introduces Susie to the room and suggests that perhaps Doc could bring her along to his upcoming science-related convention in San Francisco to show her off. Doc admits it'll be a pretty boring trip and she might not enjoy it, which she interprets as another rejection. She throws her prop apple at him and then marches out. He chases her, but it's too late. He gets back in his car to leave town again, and the party goes on without him, on the assumption he'll return eventually. Instead, a few carloads of rowdy university boys show up looking for the brothel and finding the girls at Doc's place. Mac tries to warn them away and eventually starts a fight with them, and within minutes, the entire laboratory is completely demolished. The most devastating shot is a fraternity boy getting tossed in the air and crashing down right into the octopus tank, exploding the glass in all directions and killing Doc's specimens, ruining his entire study. The fight spills out onto the street and the girls all run home. Hazel and one of the boys continue fighting alone for hours after everyone's left. When they finally give up, Hazel notices all the frogs have escaped and passes out in the mess, on top of a bunch of live frogs. A total of 4,000 frogs were collected for use in the film, and one night, 600 broke free of their enclosure, causing a minor delay in production as the slimy creatures were corralled back to set by a team of frog wranglers. Ah, uh, I wanted them to get away. I didn't want mm. them to get smashy smashed in the following scene. They wanted to be in this movie, though. I feel like they did. Then why did they try to get away? They were just trying to be on camera. When Doc returns in the early morning, he finds the place in tatters. Mac is the only one awake inside as Doc scoops up his deceased family of octopi. Now, th this I thought was interesting. I was like, octopus can survive out of the water for a little while. About uh, an hour. Yeah, I would, and and they're smart enough. I feel like they would have tried to make a make a run. Well, but I mean, they might have actually just been like trampled because they were mm. smashing this tank yeah. in the there middle was, of there the There was still party. a fight going on after this yeah. tank exploded. Did you do this? Doc, uh, I and the book boys. Did you do this, Mac? Well, we didn't meet. Doc knocks him down with a right cross, and Mac springs back up, begging for another punch, understanding he deserves it, but Doc says the moment has passed and he's over it. In the book, he keeps hitting him. Like, he knocks out a bunch of his teeth and, like, fucks oh. his face up real good. Yeah, it's oh, super no. dark. Like, it Yikes. made me really sad. Mac promises to repay all the damage, and Doc tells him in the most condescending way possible not to worry about it. Oh. 
we'll, 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 we'll pay for it, Doc. No, no, you won't, man. Don't worry about it a long time, but you won't pay for it. There's over $300 worth of broken museum glass here alone. Don't say you pay for it. That's just gonna make you feel uneasy. And it might be two or three years before you forgot about it and felt good again. Then you wouldn't pay for it anyway. Well, we gotta do something. Well, let's just forget about it. I'm over it now. Mac wakes up Hazel and drags him home. Outside, the seer plays stormy weather over his trumpet, and the narrator mentions a pall over the town. Doc cleans the lab up and makes quiet plans to replace the octopi in the spring. We see Susie pull into town with construction supplies and loading them into an abandoned boiler in an alley. Everyone assumes she's using it for storage, but she's actually converting it into a living space. The boys watch her making incremental improvements to it. She'd quit the bear flag to work at the Golden Poppy and needed a place now. In the lab, Doc is talking to his animals and mentions his 152 IQ which has dropped nearly 30 points from the novel's 181 IQ, probably because that's an outlandishly high number, yeah. <laughs> especially for a guy who makes as many mistakes in a story as Doc makes in this one. Well, just because you have a high IQ doesn't mean you got any social skills. Yeah. In fact, it probably means you have no social skills. But he should have problem-solving skills, like maybe lock this lab that people keep fucking up. Doc tells the animals he's gearing up to ask Susie out again, but he doesn't have high hopes. The only thing we have in common is that we're both wrong for each other. But if I let her go, I'll miss her. Badly. More than I'll ever regret. He interprets a rattle from one of his snakes as an argument against going to see Susie. But this snake isn't moving at all. Nope. Again, like you just put a real snake in there and you tap on the glass and it probably would have, you know, slashed at him yeah. or wiggled its rattle or whatever. <laughs> He tells the snake it doesn't know it's ass from romance. You don't even have an ass. Another sign that 181 is probably too high an IQ to ascribe to this character. <laughs> he knocks on Susie's boiler door and offers a box of candies. She guesses correctly that they're toffees because she's allergic, so of course that's what he would happen to bring. She invites him into her boiler, and it looks nice inside. She mentions a welder is coming to town to cut some windows for her. He apologizes for his reaction at the party, but she insists there's nothing to forgive. Doc is disappointed not to be making progress toward a relationship with her and tries to leave. She stops him to admit that she found out Seer is Maxie Baker, the man he hit with his pitch. He was in a mental ward for a while until Doc checked him out to take care of him. After he leaves, Susie realizes she has dodged yet another romantic proposition from the man she would like to be with. That night, Hazel checks in with Susie at the Golden Poppy. He asks her to please give Doc another chance, but Susie says she probably wouldn't bother visiting him unless he were sick or injured. Hazel takes this into account and leaves. Unloading a boat full of fish in the morning, Doc notices a hat floating in the water. It's the Sears, and he can't swim. He starts to run to the Sears beach home, but crashes into Hazel, crying and carrying the man's waterlogged corpse. Doc tries to perform CPR, but he's long gone. Susie sees Doc struggling with him, and her heart breaks for the man. So long, Max. Doc carries the Seer to the sheriff's office alone. Unburdened with the responsibility of caring for Maxie, Doc digs through his belongings for a bucket of baseballs and takes them to the beach to practice pitching again. At this point, I was very worried that it was going to turn out Hazel killed the seer so that Doc would be relieved of his debt to the man. Doc's pitches start a little wide, but when he takes off his jacket, he throws a couple dozen fastballs right down the middle. Hazel sees Doc arriving home and goes to visit him. Doc is laying down to sleep and Hazel asks a question. He wants to know if it's okay to hurt a friend if it's the only way to help him in the long run. Doc supposes that would be all right. Hazel says the seer once told him it would even be okay to kill a guy if he were in enough pain, but by now, Doc is asleep. Hazel spends some time thinking under the cypress tree and returns to Doc's place with the baseball bat later, standing over his sleeping friend. There was no longer any escape. He knew now what he must do. We see Hazel crying under the tree. We cut to a doctor. There's nothing I can do. But then the camera backs up to reveal Doc is alive and merely injured. Spring tides or no spring tides, you're going to have to wear this cast at least two months. Doc doesn't think he can collect specimens with just one arm, and amazingly, his doctor doesn't care. <laughs> of course not. 
My my doc isn't just a nickname, okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Actually studied where bones are. Doc still doesn't even understand what happened, and his doctor tells him that it looks like he got hit with a club. Mac puts together exactly what happened and heads back to the cypress tree to congratulate Hazel on a job well done. I don't understand how he doesn't instantly wake up when being struck in the arm with a bat and see Hazel standing there with a bat. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Although I did once break my brother's arm and he passed out from the pain. So maybe that So happened. maybe he didn't wake up because he went unconscious. Yeah, he, he passed out from the, the shock of the pain. Mm. But I didn't want my brother to go collect specimens alone. I wanted him to bring Susie. What? That makes sense. Hazel begs Mac to be let off the hook for the American presidency, and Mac assures him everything's going to be okay. Doc and Susie are reunited outside the Golden Poppy, and she offers to come with him on his trip to be an extra set of arms. He nearly warns her away again by describing the difficulty of the work, but catches himself and invites her along. She goes to ask her manager for time off, and he stops her with a confession. I love you. Really? Let me see your eyes. They kiss like that VJ Times Square kiss photo, and then move into the lab for some privacy. Of course, everyone's in here waiting for them because Mac wants to show off the new microscope they got him to repay him for the damage they inflicted on his place. It's the biggest one in the whole goddamn catalog! Of course, we also learn they bought it on credit and it's barely paid for at all. So far we got over six bucks collected! Do you guys recall the last time we saw someone with a fundamental misunderstanding of how buying things on credit works? (laughs) Uh, The border? That's right. Also, this is not a microscope. (laughs) What is it? A it's telescope? A telescope. It's a telescope. Telescope pointed at the table. But that's, yeah. that's clearly the point, is that yeah. it's not even a microscope. <laughs> they just bought the biggest one they could so find. so proud. The biggest one mm. in the catalog. <laughs> Mac heads back to the piano, and Doc and Susie take their first opportunity to sneak out to her boiler home. The party at Doc's place ran late into the morning again, and the narrator tells us that when the cops showed up later, they joined the party. So Mac stole their car to go on a wine run and left it parked on the beach. The credits roll over a wide shot of the row at night. So a few changes from the book. The movie's a pretty faithful adaptation of the first book alone, with a few minor changes. The love story with Susie comes entirely from the second book. The store owner in the first book is a Chinese man named Lee Chong. And the film's shop owner, Joseph and Mary, comes from the second book, having bought the store from Chong between the two halves of the story. Doc's baseball backstory is a complete fabrication. The sport isn't mentioned at all in either book. The octopi collection comes from the second book, though. But that's about it. I mean, the two stories are similar enough that it makes sense to squeeze them into one and kind of overlap things. So uh, in the book, is the seer a character? Yeah, there's a seer character, but he doesn't die there's, and he's not. There's no relationship between Demon no, Duck. No, no, no guilt strings. But yeah, that's Cannery Row. I actually really liked it. Um, the first time I watched it, I was like, that was okay. I feel like this, this isn't Ward's best work. And then I watched it like four or five times in the span of a week, and I really started to, like, get super into it. Mm. I really love the performances from almost everyone except for Deborah Winger. I feel like she feels like coming from a different time or a different... She feels a little out of the universe. She does feel a little out of the universe, but I just love how her voice cracks when yeah. she gets... Mm-hmm. She's so cute. <laughs> she's adorable, yeah. But, yeah, I, I really love everybody here, and I and I do get choked up when they're trying to to bring the seer back yeah. and it's not working out. Yeah. I, I mean, I give it a thumbs up too. Yeah. I like thumbs it. up it for me. It's fine. Uh, it's not the, it's not the greatest movie, but it's pretty good. Uh, I didn't care for this movie sure. much at all. It was, I, it's, I think I had, it took me three settings just to get through, through it once. Uh, I just felt like there was nothing, no, no real plot. Doc, Doc, Doc doesn't have a plot basically. I think that's the biggest problem the movie has is that, the relationship between him and Susie doesn't feel real mm. because it it's literally being forced by everyone around them the whole time. And whenever they launch into a fight, it never feels like an organic fight. It just feels like, yeah, but you're a prostitute. Yeah, but you're you're a silly scientist. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the entire disagreement that they have for the entire movie. And that's not enough for these characters to constantly be driven apart over. But I can see why the musical would have failed because – Back then, they were trying really hard to even avoid mentioning that she was a prostitute because it would have been much more controversial back then. So if that's not even a part of the story, then it's like, why don't these people like each other? Why isn't that in the the movie at all? I don't get it. I I almost would have preferred it to have been a musical because it felt very stage production-y a lot uh, walking around the the sets and things like that. Yeah. 
But the, um, the stages are so great. No, they, like, they are, yeah. It, and it's all, everything that you see outdoor is like a giant matte painting of, mm-hmm. you know, you have the horizon in the background behind all these buildings, but all these buildings were constructed on a soundstage. They look great. It really yeah. looks like a lived-in town, and I really love the the people that they, they populate it with. But it, it definitely had that same feel that the Sting had in sure, terms yeah. of production design, mm-hmm. aesthetic. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it does look realistic and lived in but at the same time it's like it's a fantasy version yeah uh looking at uh pictures of modern canary row yeah. because i was kind of curious how have it you looks. ever been up there i i, I have been because i've been to the mono way mono way <laughs> i've been to the monterey aquarium uh, right yeah very long time ago so I, I i didn't really take take it all in at that time i think yeah um but you know it has all those like uh archways of like of where the you know the equipment or conveyors that would take, yeah, yeah, yeah. take stuff. They're all still crossing over the streets even now. Um, and Doc's Lab, or a place they call Doc's Lab, that's like that's funny. The old in that in that mm-hmm. look of uh, unfinished wood, yeah, and you know, like tarred up wood is is there right next to the aquarium. They call it Doc's Lab. Okay. Well, Doc was a real person that the right. character was based on, but he's not a former baseball player or anything. I, I feel weird giving it a thumbs down, but. I give it a thumbs up. I'm, I'm giving it a thumbs <laughs> down. Uh, w- was not uh, super into this. But yeah, where are we putting this uh, letterbox, do you think? So I have it in fifth out of 20 for this season. Uh, it is below Venom and above A Stranger is Watching. Uh, I have it at 15th, uh, which puts it below A Beast Within, The Beast Within, not A Beast Within, but The Beast. The Beast. Never Your yeah. Beast. Uh, but above the seduction. And I have it in fifth also, just below Butterfly and just above the border. You know what? You move it a little? I actually agree with you on that, that I liked Butterfly better, which puts it two more down. Uh, I have it in seventh out of 20, which is below Butterfly and above Border. Cool. Yeah, we have it the exact same place then. I mean, obviously different numbers, but between the same two movies. Our writer-director here was David S. Ward. This was his directorial debut. He previously wrote The Sting, and he comes back next season with The Sting 2, and later The Malagro Beanfield War, Major League, which he also directed, King Ralph, which he also directed, and Sleepless in Seattle, which he wrote but did not direct. Bizarrely, his last directing credit was for Down Periscope, which he didn't write. Hmm. So that's the only one that he directed and didn't write. Mm. That's a strange collection of movies. Yeah. yeah. There's... Feels like a very wide range of the type of movies that he Considering the first three, the two Sting movies and this are all like depression era, like romanticizing old mm-hmm. film. Yeah, and very stylized, and I don't really get that from the Sting and Down Periscope. Yeah, <laughs> like, I've never seen the Malagro Beanfield War, but I've heard good things. That's that's um, Robert Redford directed, right? I think, and he uh, stars in it. I'm not sure, but King Ralph and Major League and Down Periscope are. They feel like a common universe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like the second half of his career. The writer here was John Steinbeck. Uh, This film is based on the books Cannery Row and Sweet Thursday. He also wrote the novels adapted into Of Mice and Men, The Grapes of Wrath, and so far on the show Lifeboat. His estate was apparently vocal in their disappointment with this adaptation. The other writer, William Graham, just this. He didn't have any other credits on IMDb. The music here came from Jack Nietzsche. He earlier scored One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in Hardcore. Previously on the show, he's composed Cruising, Heartbeat, Cutter's Way, and Personal Best. Later, he scores An Officer and a Gentleman, The Razor's Edge, Starman, Stand By Me, and Mermaids. And he won an Oscar for Best Original Song for composing Up Where We Belong for An Officer and a Gentleman. The cinematographer here was Sven Nykvist. He's a Swedish cinematographer best known for his collaborations with Ingmar Bergman, Cries and Whispers, Fanny and Alexander. He partnered with Woody Allen for Crimes and Misdemeanors, Another Woman, New York Stories, and Celebrity. And so far on the show, he lends Paul Mazursky's Willie and Phil and Rafelson's The Postman Always Rings Twice, both well shot films. The editor here was David Bretherton. He edited Cabaret, Slither, Westworld, and so far on the show It's My Turn and Coma. Later he cuts The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, Baby, The Secret of the Lost Legend, and Clue. Nick Nolte played Doc. His character was based on a real marine biologist and friend of Steinbeck's, Edward Doc Ricketts, the author of Between Pacific Tides, and a collaborator with Steinbeck on Log of the Sea of Cortez. Nolte prepared for the role by spending time with marine biologists in Venice, California. Before this, he'd appeared in Rich Man, Poor Man, the miniseries, The Deep, and North Dallas 40. We saw him last as Neil Cassidy in Heartbeat, 
and later he appears in 48 Hours, Extreme Prejudice, Cape Fear, Ang Lee's Hulk, Tropic Thunder, and a recurring role on the Disney Plus series Mandalorian. So was he not big yet when he was in this? Not really. He had a few things under his belt, but I don't think it was a household name yet. Yeah. Deborah Winger played Susie. We saw her last in Urban Cowboy. She has an uncredited role in E.T. later this season. And after that, in An Officer and a Gentleman, Terms of Endearment, and Legal Eagles, she reunites with Nolte in 1990's Everybody Wins. Audra Lindley played Fauna. She has credits back to the 40s. At this time, she was likely best known for one of two things. She had 912 appearances as Laura Tompkins on something called From These Roots, and she was also Helen Roper from Three's Company and the Ropers. She played Sybil Shepard's mother in Elaine May's The Heartbreak Kid, and she's back this season for Best Friends, and much later, she's the adoptive grandmother of Phoebe Buffet on Friends. Frank McRae played Hazel. He previously played as a defensive tackle with the Chicago Bears for six games in 1967. He's Captain Doyle in Loaded Weapon 1 and basically the same character renamed Decker in Last Action Hero. He's Sharky in License to Kill. He's Harry Noble in Batteries Not Included. And he reunites with Nick Nolte later this season in 48 Hours. M. Emmett Walsh played Mac. This is our ninth episode for M. Emmett Walsh after Cold Turkey, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, and Serpico in the 70s. Brubaker, Raise the Titanic, Ordinary People, Backroads, and Reds in the 80s. He's also in Mikey and Nicky, The Jerk, Blade Runner, Blood Simple, Fletch, and Critters, and more recently he's appeared in Calvary, Adventure Time, and Knives Out. And we actually just lost him about a month and a half ago. Yeah. Tom Mahoney played Huey. We saw him in our Minnesota review of On the Nickel, and he's back later this season for Night Shift. John Malloy played Jones. He's back as Traeger in Raw Deal. James Keene played Eddie. We've seen him now as a store clerk in Three Days of the Condor. He's in Close Encounters, Apocalypse Now, and we saw him in the 80s for Brubaker. He reunites with Frank McRae and Nick Nolte in 48 Hours later this season, and he's also in Ten to Midnight, The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension, and he also voiced town butcher Marty Green on Hey Arnold. Sunshine Parker played the seer. We've seen him so far as a gas station attendant with Nolte in Heartbeat, and since then in Oh God Book 2 and Any Which Way You Can as various hobos on the way to this. Later he shows up in Pee-wee's Big Adventure as a hobo, Roadhouse as Emmett, and Tremors as Edgar Deems. Yeah. The, the dead body on yeah, the cell I, tower. I almost wonder if there were scenes that were shot. Of, With him before he yeah. was supposed to be dead, yeah. He always wears that one damn jacket. Santos Morales played Joseph and Mary. We've seen him now in The French Connection, Defiance, Exterminator, Gloria, and Fort Apache the Bronx. We'll see him again this season in I Ought to Be in Pictures and Losing It. Later he's in Scarface, Summer Rental, and he's the telegraph man in Three Amigos who recommends the word infamous. I'll put infamous, El Guapo. Infamous? See, si. it means uh, murderous, evil, all like you said. And it will save you money. <laughs> Thank you. Como no. John Houston was the narrator. He directed The Maltese Falcon, The Asphalt Jungle, The African Queen, Moby Dick, The Man Who Would Be King, and so far on the show, Phobia, Wise Blood, and Victory. He's back later this season directing Annie. He also acts occasionally, as in current Patreon contender Chinatown, Tentacles, and The Visitor. We've also seen his daughter Angelica in The Postman Always Rings Twice. Ellen Blake played Wisteria. Later, she's Clara Potter in The Last Starfighter. Sharon Ernster played Agnes. Before this, she was Doreen in Take This Job and Shove It, which we'll eventually get for a minisode. Mary Margaret Amato played Lola. She's a part of Swan's Entourage in Phantom of the Paradise, and we saw her as a waitress with Nolte in Heartbeat before this. I feel like Nolte just brought a lot of people from other projects. Yeah, exactly. Brenda Hillhouse played Martha. She's credited as wife in what some would call Quentin Tarantino's first feature film, My Best Friend's Birthday, and she reunites with Quentin twice, first as Butch's mom in the Pocket Watch flashback from Pulp Fiction, and then as a hostage, Gloria Hill in From Dusk Till Dawn. Colleen Grady played The Pitcher, she doesn't have any other credits, but at first I kept thinking this was Kate Mulgrew when they were cutting back to her. <laughs> Tona Dodd played Golden Poppy Waitress. She was Mrs. Crocker in Teen Witch. Top that. Judy Kerr played Beer Milkshake Waitress. Gotta take a sip. We mentioned it again. Mm. Jesus. It's getting weird. We saw her last in All Night Long, and she looks super familiar, but nothing else on her IMDb rings a bell. Seems like she works mostly as an acting coach now. Sorry, did you have something? No, I was just, I was like, I wonder if Angelica Houston has siblings. She does have siblings. And then I saw a picture of her mother and I'm like, holy it's shit. It's just her. 
Oh, that's funny. It's Isn't just, that crazy? It's just Morticia Adams. It just looks like Morticia. <laughs> that's great. Tom Pletz played Doctor, not Doc, Doctor. We've seen him now in Foxes and Coast to Coast, and later this season he's in Jinxed and Francis. William Bronder played Susie's Trick. He appeared in Rich Man, Poor Man with Nolte and returns without him for the sequel, Rich Man, Poor Man, Book 2. We'll see him again this season in Yes, Giorgio, and later he's Milo Pressman in Stand By Me. Who's Milo Pressman in Stand By Me? That's what I'm trying to think of. He also shows up in MacGyver episode Pirates. Well, I mean, the only other two real adults, I guess, are the junkyard owner and the store clerk. Rosanna DeSoto played Ellen Sedgwick. She was Maria in Serial, which I believe is the maid who flashes a child in one of the first scenes of the film. Later, she's Connie Valenzuela in La Bamba, Fabiola Escalante in Stand and Deliver, and Azitbur in Star Trek VI Undiscovered Country. Azitbur? Am I saying that hmm. right? Do you know that character? Imagine not. Walter Matthews played Sonny. We saw him last season as the commissioner in Nighthawks. Art LaFleur was the doorman at the Golden Bear restaurant. We've seen him now in Hollywood Nights in Any Which Way You Can. Looking up his credits, I was sure he was the gas station attendant in How to Beat the High Cost of Living, but that was Art Matrano, not Art LaFleur. <laughs> Mixed up my arts. LaFleur is back later this season for I Ought to Be in Pictures and Jekyll and Hyde Together Again, and later War Games, Cobra, The Blob Remake, Field of Dreams. He's the babe in The Sandlot, and one of his later roles was as the Tooth Fairy in the Tim Allen Santa Claus movies. I love him in The Blob Remake, though, because he's the guy at the pharmacy who sells the kid the condoms, mm. and then when he shows up to his girlfriend's house, he's also her dad. Oh. It's like, fuck, I just bought condoms from this guy. Joshua Lawrence played Boy. He's back later this season for his second and final role as Billy Fitzgibbons in The Secret of Nim. Hey, can someone look up if he's related to Joey? Bringing him up. No, IMDb doesn't have anything else other okay. than he's in... Joe Michael Terry played Tucker. We saw him last as a law clerk in First Monday in October. Not much else I recognized. Carl Charfalio played Tackle. This was his first feature film. Later he appears in MacGyver episode Silent World, License to Kill, Eve of Destruction, and Free Jack. But my favorite credit of his on IMDb was as The Thing in Roger Corman's unreleased Fantastic Four film. I hope Feige's planning a cameo for Corman's Fantastic Four actor somewhere in the MCU version. Reed Rondell played Frat Boy number one. He has mostly stunt credits and one we've already seen as the flaming Cropsy Maniac in the cold open of The Burning. In that same episode, we also mentioned that Rondell sadly passed away five years later after a helicopter crash on the set of Airwolf. John Meyer played Frat Boy number two, again, mostly stunt credits, but we had him in Herbie Goes Bananas, and next season he's back in The Outsiders, and later he's a cop in Last Action Hero. Tim Culbertson played Frat Boy number three. He's cop slash security in Cheech and Chong's next movie, The Devil and Max Devlin and An Eye for an Eye. He returns this season as one of Khan's henchmen in Star Trek II. He's the guy like holding Paul Winfield in place as they put those weird earbugs on them. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was trying to picture. Yeah. Because, because uh, all those henchmen look very distinct. Yeah. And I probably could pick them out of a lineup. Scott Wilder played Frat Boy number four. He's credited as Cycle Lord in Grease Two later this season. He also did some stunts in Night Riders for us, so he must be a biker. Gilbert B. Combs played Frat Boy number five. We've seen him now in Tom Horn and History of the World. He's an Enterprise engineer in Wrath of Khan later this season, and even later shows up in Star 80 and Robocop. Christopher Doyle was Frat Boy number six. This was his first film. Later he shows up as Leechman, or Leechman, in Return of Swamp Thing. He's a goon in Dark Man. He's a dope party shooter in Kindergarten Cop, and he's multiple characters in nearly every iteration of Star Trek from TNG through Enterprise. But in 21 assorted episodes, none of his characters have names, which is a bummer. You'd think they'd throw mm. him a bone at some point. Gary McClarty played Frat Boy number seven. Gary McClarty is a famous stunt coordinator in his own right, who we saw holding a Grover doll right before the Blues Brothers crashed into a toy store in that film. Insane life story for this guy, though. In July of 1982, McClarty was one of six people on board the Bell UH-1 Iroquois helicopter that famously crashed on the set of Twilight Zone, killing Vic Morrow and two child actors. Mm. In 1991, McClarty shot and killed his roommate, whom he suspected of sexually assaulting a family member. Evidently, the man was an ex-con, and McClarty had offered him a place to stay to get back on his feet, but the man's behavior had grown increasingly erratic over time. McClarty phoned the police to report the shooting himself, claiming he acted purely in self-defense, and when officers arrived at McClarty's Silmar apartment complex, an unrelated neighbor with outstanding warrants assumed they were here to arrest him <laughs> and allegedly opened fire on the cops, oh who God. promptly shot and killed that man. What? 
Following standard LAPD operating procedure, they then deployed tear gas into the complex, which, as tradition dictates, caused a raging fire and burned the place to the ground. <gasps> what? We this got him. We got him, boys. <laughs> mission accomplished. But that's a thing that keeps happening. Anytime they use tear gas, they're like, oh, must have been some crazy problem with the tear gas and it caused a fire. It's like, no, it causes a fire like every time no, and it always burns the house down. Tear gas canisters get insanely hot. Yeah. So if they touch anything combustible, it will start a fire. Yeah. In 2005, McClarty testified in court that actor Robert Blake offered him $10,000 to kill his wife, Bonnie Lee Backley, who, by sheer coincidence, was later shot by a complete stranger and her murder remains unsolved to this day. <laughs> what? David LaBelle played diner patron uncredited, another famous stuntman and the son of legendary stuntman Gene LaBelle, who famously put Steven Seagal in a sleeper hold until he shit himself on the set of Under Siege. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Confirmed by many people present. Wow. I just... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like the the freaking uh, hot rod. Is there a technique that you can hit somebody and make some shit themselves? Like, I won't lie to you. That technique does exist. <laughs> Is there a tai chi move that would make a grown man crap his pants and not know why? Not gonna lie to you, Rod. That move does exist, but you're not ready for it yet. Anne Lockhart played barmaid. We saw her in Earthbound, and she's back this season as a nurse in ET. Later, she appears in Ten to Midnight, Risky Business, and Troll as the younger version of her mother June Lockhart's character. Tom Willett played the bartender uncredited. He was a kissing cowboy in Melvin and Howard and smaller roles in History of the World Part 1 and Stripes. We saw him recently in Pennies from Heaven and Reds, and he's back this season for Grease 2, My Favorite Year, and Airplane 2. He's a grave digger in Psycho 2. He's a theater patron in Johnny Dangerously and a banquet guest in Fletch. Lots of mostly featured extra parts in big movies, but a few credits as Abe Lincoln. <laughs> including Did you say Hey Blinken? <laughs> no, I didn't say Hey Blinken. But he does have a few credits as Abe Lincoln, including a show called Bringing Up Jack, and then The Drew Carey Show, and he's also Abe Lincoln in Shane Black's Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was like, why don't we just bring everyone back to life? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's everything for Cannery Row. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find all our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. If you enjoy what we're doing, consider giving us a review on iTunes. I don't think it helps visibility, but it's good for morale. And if you really like the show, maybe you should join our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash vintage video podcast for access to all our monthly 70s reviews and a hand in choosing next month's film. Patrons are currently choosing between Captain Kronos, Vampire Hunter, Chinatown, The Dion Brothers, Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, Gatorbait, The Groove Tube, Herbie Rides Again, The Nine Lives of Fritz the Cat, The Parallax View, Spies, Three the Hard Way, or Where the Red Fern Grows for a 50th anniversary review next month. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Love and Money, which IMDb describes like so. A billionaire businessman hires a man to influence a South American dictator. He winds up having an affair with the billionaire's wife. What? <laughs> we leave you now with a trailer, if there is one, and I don't believe there is, for love and money. You must think I'm as insane as you are. Answer me. What's the question? What is so special about me that you do all the things that I could have you arrested for? Your eyes, your smile. I didn't smile at you. Okay, I guess it was your eyes then. You must be very lonely. No. It's just that when I saw you, I knew. Knew what? That God put his elbow in my ribs. I want to get out. Go ahead. What are you doing? Wait! What are you, trying to kill us? What's the matter with you? Close the door! I thought you were going to kill me anyway. I said if you ever made love to your husband... I, I did. <laughs>